uh, those guys are really tired, and instead of doing it on the replica, they, they did it on the production database. Um, so it crashed, it went down to zero. Uh, they eventually recovered, um, but they had to recover from uh, a staging backup that they had, which was six hours old. Um, all of this was obviously pretty transparent, and everything that was happening was being live streamed, so we had a pretty good sense of the, all the stuff that was happening. It was, it was a fair bit of an impact that, were, that happened uh, happened in GitLab, they lost uh, six hours of data. And the most glaring thing that I noticed in, in their docs was the fact that they had five backup and replication strategies in place, and none of them worked at the critical moment of time. Um, this is kind of a nice cute segue into what my talk is about. Uh, it's about uh, replication, um, practices around clustering tools that help you in replication. Um, it's about finding failures in those current practices that we have. I'm also going to be proposing a new design on top of these tools. I'm not going to be rewriting a tool entirely, but I'm going to be proposing an abstraction on top of these, and I'll just illustrate some scenarios. Um, but before we do that, I just would like to um, give a sense of a context about Postgres, just a small primer into some of the things that would be useful for the talk. Um, uh, the, the way we use the term DB cluster, specifically in this talk, would be to define a cluster which is used for like high performance and availability, and not talk about a single database that has multiple databases on the same node. So we'll be talking about uh, database clusters in terms of availability and performance, which is basically means um, a single master and multiple standby kind of scenario. Um, we will talk about availability, so I should clear out what that means. Um, the word availability is thrown, out, uh, thrown around a lot. And what that means in the most idealistic scenario is that your system has like no, like zero points of failure. And the number of failures you can tolerate is infinite. Um, but that's obviously not possible ever. Um, and so we derive a term from that which is highly available which means we sort of tend towards reducing as many points of failures in your system as much as we can. And the number of failures you could tolerate is F, which F is defined by you based on what your use case is. So if you're maybe running a critical financial system sort of a thing, this number might be a really low. Um, Postgres already has a few things built in for this. Uh, it's just namely write ahead logs and standbys and replicas. Um, right ahead logs are useful because if you have a crash while you're inserting a tuple on a page, uh, you can't replay it back. The way Val solves that is uh, while you're inserting the page, as soon as the page is inserted, it would write, um, it would commit to a Val segment, which at, uh, which at some point if it crashes, you can just, your background writer process can eventually replay it back at some point. This is kind of this fail safe mode of uh, write early as possible and be able to replace stuff. Uh, the other areas of uh, success that Postgres provides, it provides you uh, replicas. You can, if your master database dies, you can move over to a new database. Um, and regardless of the brand of failures in your system, whether it be like 80% distributed on DFS or partitions or cyclones, you sh your database should be able to tolerate any of them. Um, the way we do replicas is, of course, by specification. And um, these three are the more or less the condensed version of how you would do them. If, you're, if you have a file system replication, it would some, some look something like an incremental snapshot from ZFS, post it on uh, a storage bucket, and then potentially replay it back if something crashes. This is obviously not consistent, and it's not incremental. Um, or you could do logical backups where you just dump and restore. Uh, the most obvious one is the streaming backup uh, that most people use. It, it provides consistent and incremental backups. Um, and what it also does it, is it, um, it takes forward the philosophy of Val. It takes forward the philosophy of write-ahead logs when we're specifically talking about synchronous standbys. Um, it, what that means is when you insert something into the primary database, it sends the wall segment over to the sync standby. And it receives the fact that it's received, the, it acts the fact that it's received the while log, and it acts the fact that it's flushed the while log. 
and only then will it get committed to uh, the primary database. This, the reason why I draw the analogy with Val is because they're doing sort of similar things where you're writing first to a place before you're actually writing it, kind of a thing. And it, it obviously doesn't matter when you're dealing with async standby because it, the commit would already happen anyway. Um, so let's look at some of the tools. Um, we have a bunch of those around. This is a snapshot from a wiki, uh, PostgreSQL wiki, and there's a lot of them around. And not all of them don't necessarily orchestrate your cluster as well. Uh, some of them do, and some of them don't. But what we really want from a clustering tool, quote unquote, is more than just, just a cool API on top of doing failovers and promotions and stuff. We want to be able to govern the cluster as well. Um, so I have some properties listed on over here, which I think at the very least should be a part of a clustering tool or an orchestration tool, if you want to call it, a cluster orchestration tool. The fact that it should know that the service that we're dealing with is inherently a singleton. What that means is that there's only one master. If something goes down, it should stay down. And if something comes up, that is the only thing that is always up. We're specifically dealing with a single master, not a multi-master scenario. So this is the property that applies to clustering tools that deal with that. It should be highly available, and we know what that means. Uh, the failover should be automatic. This is a given. Um, this is kind of important where the consumer should be able to refresh connections, which means if something changes upstream in the database cluster, the app should be able to know about this. This is an important problem where uh, a lot of clustering to tools don't actually look at that well. Um, and we should try and avoid application state, which means if, if you're running a Node.js closure application, it shouldn't know about what the hell is happening upstairs in the Postgres world. It should just treat that as a black box. Uh, uh, did you just contradict the thing there? Like, when, when you say that consumer should be able to refresh connections, you said it should, I should be able to ask an application, I should be able to figure out that something went wrong there. I'll get to that, what that means, which consumer that I'm talking about. And so there's consumers and there's applications. So I'll make a differentiation there. Um, so we went to PGA Asia in Singapore last year, and there were a lot of suggestions around which tools to use. Um, Largely, that was around Rev Manager and uh, People ID and UCAR. Th th those seem to be uh, popular tools, it, it, it seems like, uh, in the Postgres community for doing like a very simplistic uh, failover mechanism around Postgres databases. I would like to clarify that these are network-oriented tools and not clustering tools, um, which means they only deal with IPs. Um, People ID and UCAR are mostly similar. They're built on the VRRP protocol, which what it basically does it is um, assigns um, IPs to all the hosts that are participating in the clusters. Um, it provides a health check to see if the service is up and down. And they're both pretty similar. You can't keep like uh, the major components of keep like the uh, uh, health check, which you probably would do on each of your nodes, seeing uh, if you can insert into it, probably a master, and if you can select from it, probably a standby and stuff like that to see if it's up or down. And you have these two hooks, which is notify master and standby. When the health check fails, you would just promote new standby uh, based on priorities. And if the uh, and the rest of the standby that are remaining would start following the new master. They also have a hook into notify standby, the remaining nodes that are not master. Uh, just a quick rundown as to how it works. So you have a virtual IP. Uh, each of these people IDs would be running on each of your database nodes. Uh, the virtual IP is assigned to the master database, uh, which means the apps, talk, the apps talk to the virtual IP, which means they talk to the master database. So if the uh, master database goes down, the virtual IP gets assigned to this standby because it has a higher priority than this one. These priorities you can set in the Keepal ID configuration. Um, what it also does is if this master comes back, it will reassign this virtual IP back to the old master, which is a problem. It is a huge problem. This means you now have two parallel timelines in databases. Um, to fix that issue, there is a way you can fix this issue by setting no preempt on the master node and calling it a backup. This is obviously already looking pretty terrible. This is extremely non-intuitive that you have to set the status backup. And, uh, and, then, and then you have to say that it's not no preempt. The, the way you can do that in uh, UCAP, I'll just add in this for reference, that you can do, actually do that much simply in UCAP, which is to preempt flag to know. 
Um, but, but this is a major problem. It means that uh, whenever you're setting this configuration, it only needs to be on the master. The no preamp only has to be on the master. It can't be on standby nodes, otherwise it won't preempt, which means it won't actually switch over ever. Which means every time you switch over, the new master needs to get updated with this configuration. Which means every time you switch over, you have to update a configuration and reload keep a library for that node. Um, it does, doesn't have any, any idea about um, the service being up or down necessarily on the level at which the database is operating. It's only operating at the level of if a node is up or down. It's kind of like a ping check of sorts. And it does IP flapping. The, the scenario that you saw is called flip flopping, where the, I, the IP is reclaimed by, by the original master. And this is also pretty important to point, which it doesn't do a cluster level consensus. What that means it, it, is that it doesn't have any idea about the, the standby lagging behind from the master by how much. Like it doesn't take care of any of these things. It could. It's it's not it's not meant to be that. It's not it's not a low level cluster oriented tool. It could, but you would have to write that on your own. Which means other problems like making sure that you're coordinating this value across nodes. So this becomes a kind of a hard problem to deal with when you're dealing with these like. So if you if you do a quick property check, um, this thing immediately fails. Uh, and this is a big deal. Um, but we do have cluster into tools uh, that you can use. Uh, Rep Manager D is one of them. Rep Manager D is a part of Rep Manager, which is uh, a clustering slash replication tool. It's a daemon that comes along with this, which sets its own database on your main uh, master, on your main cluster database. And it updates the cluster status of the cluster that's going. So you'll have a master standby, and you'll have priority for those. And you can also see which node that it's up. The standby is on the one, the standby is on the one. Um, it also gives you these cool API functions like uh, you can I, I, you can do all of these with Postgres as well. Just plain old Angular like Postgres, where it puts you with a nice API on top of doing all of this. You can do stuff like register a new master, standby register, and stuff to show and all of that. Uh, the way that Manager D works is uh, it sits on top of your uh, database. Um, it expects, in most cases, it expects a passwordless SSH connection between each of these Red Manager, each of these databases. So you would basically have one node with your database. You would have a Red Manager database running there, and you would have a Red Manager D running there as well, governing all the rest of the Red Manager. Uh, and your apps would probably talk into the master database, which is governed by the manager. This is the condensed version of what it looks like. So if you have the way it works, so if you have a system like this, where you have um, a master slave slave setup, and then at some point, uh, master goes down, uh, it gives you this hook. Uh, as we saw previously, uh, it has these, these commands. Rep manager hooks into one of these commands and gives you this hook to do stuff. So when this promotion happens for this, you can do stuff. Like, for example, tell your apps about it. Um, what it also does is give you a hook about following the new master, so the new standby also starts following the new master. If you have a PG bouncer-like setup, which is um, which is an external connection pool, uh, most of you might have heard of this. Uh, in the cases where PG bouncer is sitting on isolated on your database node, it can go and tell all the PG bouncers that hey, update your configuration files and point to the new master. Um, it also does low-level node help. Uh, consensus, which means the healthiest node will be picked. Uh, so if you have two standbys that share the same priority, the healthier node will be picked out of them based on how far away it is from the master. I actually have written some tests around this. You can take a look at this link. Uh, it does sort of this regression testing type thing on this to ensure that this property is indeed true. Um, so, but let's look at this at scale. Um, let's say we're talking about 10 addresses, 10 applications here. Uh, we're talking about 10 applications that we want to have this push notification to. It starts to become slightly crusty. Uh, and uh, you can think of what, what happens if these applications are not 10, if they're 20, if they're 50 or 100. This, this starts to become really tedious. Um, I'm specifically talking about applications that are maybe running app connection pools 
locally, which means they have application level connections too. May or may not, or most likely they are. Uh, but we can see the point of failures here. Um, there's a great chance as you increase this by scale that a lot of these start dying out. Um, network is unreliable, we know this for sure, and this, this point at which it's doing the promotion is a single point of failure. To easily fix this issue, to easily at least fix the issue over here, what you could do is do the same thing from Polymaster. Uh, you could make the same calls from Polymaster, and yes, you've increased the surface area of success, but now you've got this complex graph of potential failures. Basically, if you have n number of DB nodes, if you have m application nodes, the amount of network calls you're making for, to do this is you can grow pretty large. Um, just a small sidetrack as to where I'm coming from this for this uh, is just an anecdote. Uh, we were running a, a closure system with extremely strict SLAs. So we we're talking about less, most, we we're talking about uh, 10 milliseconds, 99 percentile for 2,000 requests per second. Um, we were not confident with this trigger sort of mechanism from Red Manager because it was just too prone to failures and we needed high availability. It was an extremely critical application. We were using application connection pools for performance reasons. We didn't want the hops that you get from DB one -third. So we added another line of defense, uh, which was basically a really silly master check that uh, the application itself would do to the databases. So the application is aware of all the databases, so I would just go and try and see if I can insert this. I can insert this. The promotion probably happened, but maybe the network calls hadn't succeeded, so we'll at least try to see if we can do an insert. So we can be at least sure that uh, the promotion happened, but maybe the network calls didn't succeed, so let's let's try to uh, do it from the app side. But this is this kind of crafts over all the properties that we have. If you build this kind of a thing, this just like it's it introduces app state for one. All this all your information about the DB nodes is in your app. And it's not resilient for network splits. Like it won't work when there's a network split. So just to clarify what I mean by the trigger mechanism is that you could literally have two of them. That's mostly the way you could build them. Uh, one is that you do not promote your new master if you can't send a successful response to all your apps or your consumers or your bouncers. Or you could make it so that only a certain amount of those things are successful. Or you could just promote first and fire all these, fire and forget calls to all your apps and your consumers. This is a script from the rep manager documentation, which does the second form of, uh, which does the second form of this trigger mechanism, where it pauses, so this is specifically dealing with PG bouncers, it's not talking to applications. Um, but the idea is still the same, where uh, it pauses the PG bounce and it promotes them, and then it reconfigures the PG bouncers. So it means the promotion has already happened. This may or may not happen, anything. Yeah. We know this is a fallacy, like this is obviously a fallacy and there be, there's no more discussion required uh, post this. That means the PG bouncer will be running in all the... Yes, so this is the, that script assumes that the PG bouncer is running on all the uh, You could run PG bouncer in various other ways, of course. You can run PG bouncers on your app server as well, uh, if you need to, but there are some trade-offs regarding that. People run PG bouncer on your app servers to reduce the hop, usually, because if if you have a network call talking to the replica, it will have to go make another network call to the master eventually. So there are like two network hops. Some people run them on app servers, but there are some trade-offs that you can read about what that means exactly. Um, and there's, there's also the question of separation of concerns, which is a big deal for me. Um, this promotion is uh, dependent on large number of network calls to be successful. Um, your database promotion script is now aware of all your apps and your bouncers, which is a concern that it should not be dealing with. Your database promotion should only deal with promotion of the databases. And if this is the scenario that I was describing about, you probably have an API endpoint like slash callback failover type thing in your application to receive all these updates. So it seems to me that the problem is kind of lying around the idea of this trigger mechanism itself. 
what it's doing is it's doing this kind of sort of fire and forget call at a very critical decision point in your app. And we're talking about large scale here. Maybe this doesn't apply when you're just dealing with two apps and two databases. There is no retry logic built in, obviously. These are scripts that you have to write. Um, and you would have to write your own retry logic, and you could, but you probably don't want to do that. Um, and it is a single point failure, and you hopefully never need to make and handle these many calls as your system grows in the amount of apps or bouncers that you're adding to your system. So we can see that Red Manager does most of these tasks well, but we are not quite sure if we can solve this problem easily, because it seems like we're introducing state to our consumers. May it be PG bouncers or may it be applications. Uh, we kind of want to be around here. Uh, so I have a proposition to make. Um, we've seen that writing to the database is, uh, is solved kind of a mostly solved by Postgres, the integrity issues and the val logs and stuff like that. But we're not quite sure whether uh, this problem is solved, which is we're not quite sure if failing over to a new database is highly available. Or telling the clients about the new master is a problem that is can be solved and be increased when the scale increases. And, so, and, and we know that this this does a good job. Like Rep Manager D does a good job at consensus. It does the low level health uh, checks. It's battle tested and it's, it's, in my experience, it has worked reliably in the past. So my proposition is um, a poll and a push mechanism, which is you move the concern of sending all this information from your failover scripts, which are fire and forget scripts, outside those scripts to be able to build better retrying systems. You could build them on the scripts themselves, but as a pragmatic programmer sense, it doesn't make sense to dissolve those concerns into one. It, it obviously frees up um, the database promotion from any other external services that you may be running and you may need to inform about. And what you can also do if you do it outside these scripts, and I'm specifically now going towards a system where it's kind of a service that's running on your database node, that a lot of nodes can publish the same information, which means you're increasing the area of success. You're not just one script is doing this, a lot of, a lot of nodes are doing this. And they can do this because Rep Manager has uh, ways where you can query Rep Manager and see what the new cluster is. What this also allows, if you move this uh, responsibility outside these scripts, is you can monitor stuff pretty easily. Or uh, you can monitor the process itself that if you do run this script, if it were a script, that it would be successful. So if it's not a script, then you can have a heartbeat of the service saying that I've been up for this long you're confident that it will remain up for this long during catastrophic times. You can obviously keep an eye on Red Manager D as well. And you can also do Zookeeper node monitoring, which I'll come to why we need that in the first place. Um, so it sounds like we do not want to be handling retries to our apps that much, because that is a hard problem. Because now you have to build retry mechanisms around places that can grow indefinitely, and that can grow without any concern to your database. So we should move that responsibility over to telling your apps and bouncers to a central data source. We also want to avoid um, any application states, and again, um, exposing any API endpoints, because we just want to use the apps and talk to the database as a black box. Um, so what do we use for the central data store if we agree to doing this in the first place? And this is a proposition, so just bear with me. Um, it needs to be battle tested, of course. It needs to be around for a while. It needs to be strongly consistent. What, what that means is since we'd be uh, trying to do this from multiple nodes, the operations should be atomic, which means if you read something, it changes, and you try to write something back, it should fail. And it should be highly available. And we now know what that means. So I specifically picked Zookeeper for this. Uh, I know there's a lot of them around with that and console and stuff like that. 
uh, one of the reasons that I picked the people for this is because the reason why I was writing this in the first place uh, was where we had an infrastructure where we had two people set up, but you could obviously just, um, replace this with uh, with the data store of your choice. It, it's a good data store. It's, it, it fulfills all the uh, all the properties that we want from a central data store. It's a nice sort of key value pair type system. It has compare and swap, which means it does atomic operations, and it has something called ephemeral nodes. Um, ephemeral nodes are places uh, or write locations on the Zookeeper file system that are only around as long as the client that is writing to them is connected to Zookeeper, which means if the client goes away, the node will go away. Uh, and that is a really <coughs> clean solution, I feel, for just basically doing service discovery. Because that's the kind of thing that we're trying to do here. It's just sort of a more just kind of service discovery type thing here. So I've written this thing. Um, it's called Agrijag. Uh, it's basically this orchestrator uh, that folds and then broadcasts this information to Zookeeper. Uh, the reason why it says tables parts is because they're one of our clients, and the reason why we had to write this is because uh, we needed this in their system. Um, it comes from, it's just a banal reference from Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, if anyone's read that. Uh, it's a creature that Arthur Dent, I think, has tried to kill a lot of times, but has failed because this guy keeps reincarnating all the time. Um, so how this works is basically like an orchestrator. So it runs on your database nodes. Um, it keeps reading from Rep Manager, each of these aggregates. You would run individually <coughs> each of these across your nodes. And they keep posting to the zookeeper cluster that you have. Um, and Rep Manager D runs as it does. So all your regular database setup doesn't change. You don't need to add, you don't, don't need to change your existing system. You just need to add more stuff to it. Uh, we know that Rep Manager provides this command, which is the Rep Manager cluster show command. Um, and what it gives you is the current live status of the database. So if you run it on a healthy cluster, it will tell you what the cluster is looks like. If you run it on a failed cluster, it will tell you the state of that failed cluster as it were when it was healthy. So it basically gives you snapshots of like the current, wherever you run it, it gives you a snapshot of the health status of the cluster. What we also have a rep manager is a table called REPL event. It's actually a view, if I'm not wrong, but it gets updated by rep manager. Um, what it gives you is an audit log of events. Um, and so you can say stuff like, uh, there was a failover that happened, and it happened during this time. And I want to, I want that information, and it'll also tell you which master was promoting stuff like that. And we have uh, zookeepers compare and swap. Uh, by the way, Agrijag is written in Clojure, so uh, you maybe see a few lines of Clojure every now and then. This is the compare and swap function that we have in Agrijag. On to combining all these three things, we can build a simple sort of run loop around uh, the system. So the run loop basically what it does is it reads from the REPL events table for the newest. Uh, promotion on a master. It does a rep manager cluster show. It compares whether those two masters are the same. It checks whether that master is actually writable. This is optional, of course. You can choose to ignore this. Um, and it, this is a sort of a second line of defense where it actually tries to insert and checks whether the, uh, the information provided by rep manager is indeed correct. So it'll try to do that. And it'll, and it'll do a compare and start on Zookeeper if, if the master is new, which means if there's already a master sitting there, which it probably will be, if the new, if the one that we're trying to write is newer than the one that is already there, it means you need to update this. And, and then it keeps looping around, keeps doing this. It's just a run loop. Um, what this also allows you to do as an orchestrator is uh, build more lines of defenses. Since this is a separate service, you can just keep tapping on, just shoving in more lines of defenses into this orchestrator as as and when you as and when you please. If threat manager D is dead, you can do as a very very fail safe scenario, do a manual master check on the databases, and you can build other kinds of uh, defenses that I can't personally think of at the moment. Um, however, to build the system, um, there are some concerns that we should be aware of. These are kind of the, the back of the envelope concerns that I have. Um, 
some of these, uh, you can listen and I'll go through them individually in each slide as well. But one is stateful reads from zookeeper. So we're definitely trying to avoid stateful reads uh, because that's one of the properties that we set. Uh, we, we don't want state in the consumers of, uh, of the system. So the application audio bouncer will still have to read from zookeeper. So is it actually stateless? It is if you use these. Uh, Zookeeper provides watchers, which basically are something to the extent of, hey, something has changed on Zookeeper upstream. Let me do something else. This is purely stateless. You don't have to store, hey, this was the old master. Now this is the new master. And now I have to update my current master in the app. You don't have to do any of that, because the watcher will do that for you. It's completely stateless. Um, the way, this is an ex example of how the ephemeral nodes would work. Um, so, so one of the other issues that we have here is the dependency on orchestrator, which means now uh, your application is dependent on Zookeeper telling you who the correct master is. So how do you ensure that Zookeeper is not telling you the wrong master, like it's not a stale master? You can ensure that by ephemeral nodes, which means uh, if one of the average acts go down, it will disconnect the external node. So this is the D node. This is the D node where we store the master information and the rest of the cluster information. And we have these ephemeral nodes that are connected to uh, the main master, the style nodes that are ephemeral. This is persistent. This is persistent persisted on Zookeeper. These are not. Um, and these are children of these master nodes. So whenever Agrizaz does something, it also makes sure that it attaches an ephemeral node for itself, which means that the Agrizaz goes down. Um, this node would go down, which means, as a result, that if you have zero ephemeral nodes to your master node, it means Agrizag is not running, which means your your master information is probably wrong. So that way you can ensure that the dependency um, is strict. So you can make a check like proceed only if the master is present, and ephemeral nodes are greater than zero on the master. Uh, what, what happens when there is a network partition? is a split brain. Assuming there is a witness server set up with that manager, for those of you who don't know what a witness server is, it's just a decoy uh, database server that doesn't actually have any <coughs> data. It just, it just serves as a kind of a voting majority for the consensus for your server. So it's just like a server sitting with no information. It just has a priority, and it just participates in consensus. Because we have all those checks in place in Agrojack, it will implicitly fence the old master based on the promotion time. This is this is an important point because this is something I want to do. Uh, when the master dies, we want to isolate that master entirely. It's, it's typically known as Tron, as it shoots the node in the head, also known as node fencing. We want to be able to do that because if it comes back up and the apps are talking to it, we don't want the apps to be writing to an older failed master if it has come back up. So we want to be able to fence these masters. Um, so we know that it does it by, we, it, we do a validity check with REPL event and cluster show, which means we can solve this split brain problem implicitly. We can implicitly fence the node because we're doing a timestamp check. So an older cluster, during a split brain, the old master will always have an older master promotion time. The newly elected master, as the split happens, will have a newer promotion time, which means that will cancel these requests. Because the ones that have been written from here are newer than the ones that are here. Um, and we implicitly sort of solve this fencing issue during or without a network partition scenario as well. And we know that uh, if all of these die out, this will go to null. And so we basically kind of disconnect these aggregates out of the place. So in during a split, we just kind of fence this entire uh, cluster away. Because these aggregates um, are unable to connect to Zookeeper. Um, what happens when there's a network split in Zookeeper? That's another concern. Um, so imagine a scenario, it, though it may seem contrived, but all of these are sort of back of the envelope concerns where they can happen, and they probably will happen, is where there's a network split between one of the Zookeeper cluster nodes 
and one of your application servers. So Zookeeper runs in a clustered way, where if you write to the cluster, if, say if you have three Zookeeper cluster nodes, it will replicate this information amongst itself. So it just sort of uh, spreads this information around and makes sure that it's consistent and highly available. So what happens if one of these clusters dies? And the app, and there's a split around this, so the app can only talk to this Zookeeper node and nothing else. So which means these things can't talk to this, these things can't talk to this, these things can only talk to this, and these three database nodes can only talk to these two Zookeeper nodes. Um, the same thing applies basically over here as well. Since it can't talk to it, it will drop all these ephemeral nodes. Since there is a network split here, these aggregates can't talk to it, ephemeral node uh, count goes down to zero, and the app basically can't proceed further because the check failed. Uh, but we still have... Uh, to clarify, that, that's a false negative, right? Your working decently good master went down because of a zoo people. It just, they're technically adding a failure which didn't exist before. Like the master works is fine, it's just that your zookeeper went out or hit a split brain. No, no, so the yeah. app has also hit a split brain, which means if in the normal scenario, the app will still not be able to talk to this. Yeah, so we've so not added a contrived example. Uh, no, it, uh, let's assume the third app was always talking to the third master. And it well, this is not the case here. It can't talk to the third master anymore. Uh -huh. no, because it's, it's a network split, right? It can't access anything above that. So it can't access that, those that, nodes, it can't access that those zookeeper nodes, it can't access the app either. That's not uh, absolutely necessary, right? For example, you're using Zookeeper for the consensus information, you pull it, you get the uh, location of the DB and you're talking to the DB right now. Right. right? That, that can keep happening, right? The, there could be a case where the, you only have like a partial sort of error, right? The Zookeeper consensus is broken, but you still can talk to the DB though. Like, you can still, no, but this app can't talk to the DB because it's in a network split. It's a network split, right? It can't, so this is, basically shove this line across and take it off the screen. And the app can't talk to anything at all. It can, since the source of truth has started to become Zookeeper now, that is the only thing we're reading from. And so this scenario, the, po the point of this scenario is what happens when there's this actual split in Zookeeper itself, since we've called it the new source of truth. So that's a completely possible scenario. Um, however, the app still has information about this upstream dependency, which means it still has some state about um, aggregates, um, which which may or may not be a great uh, thing for your application. So there are some things you can do. You can move it to Consti, which is a, a popular tool that people use as a zookeeper watcher, and just place it on your nodes, which will keep updating your configuration if you're dealing with PG watchers. Or you could write your own aggregate client. Uh, this is something that we've done. There's an aggregate client that exists in Clojure. You can put it in your Clojure app which will basically do all the watcher stuff that we saw before. But now the watchers are still prone to failures. Um, however, we can be rest assured that the watchers that we're dealing with are client libraries given by Zookeeper. That's literally it, that is the only thing. And we can trust that because those libraries have been working reliably in the past and they have a good track record of working reliably in the past. They also only read from a central location that we can trust, which is Zookeeper. And multiple nodes, which is all the standby nodes, including the master node, have had a chance to update that same single D node location, which has been uh, replicated across the zookeeper nodes. Some of the uh, suggestions that I had, and one of the concerns I want to deal with is, people told me, that, hey, why not just update HA proxy configuration instead, um, which is a good idea, but HA proxy does not have a compare and stop functionality, which means you can have overlapping writes and get into a really bad state. Doesn't have atomic writes. What about speed? Um, so Rep Manager already has a configuration like this, which is you can specify the amount of A-connect attempts, and you can specify the interval at which to try the attempt. And Agrajar also has this configuration around uh, setting the sequence CMS. So how <coughs> often do you want to poll while you're currently set to five seconds? And sort of this combination of both, you can it's basically up to you how you want to deal with it. If you want really fast, uh, you might want to reduce these numbers and take it to a really low. Um, so in the entirety, after like going through all these concerns, uh, we will add some new concepts into this, which is uh, it's doing the same thing, the event loop, uh, but it's also doing this new master check before writing. 
uh, which is basically to say if that if the master that we're trying to write is indeed new, we will do the update on zookeeper and update the ephemeral node. If it's the same, we won't write anything because it's the same. And we'll still update the ephemeral node. If it's the older one, we won't write it and we'll disconnect the ephemeral node. This basically covers all the cases. It, it, from our testing that we've seen, um, this covers most of network partition cases and uh, timelines. Um, so what are we kind of trying to do here is something that I want to cover because this is kind of open-ended. Uh, it seems like uh, we're not trying to reinvent, obviously. We're not trying to rewrite either. We're just trying to plug holes, which is in a very crass way of saying you're kind of slapping etch on top of etch. And so where do you draw the line when you see holes in uh, an already running system? I would say uh, one of the things is the uh, network. Um, this is uh, always a fallacy. Don't depend on it. And avoid consensus if, if you can, um, because that's really hard. That's a really hard problem. And Rep Manager already solves that problem to some extent. Right? It already does consensus. So all we're doing is just sort of plugging holes that may occur in the process of having Rep Manager. So we're only, if we're only adding new passages. We've only added an average jack to the system. We haven't fundamentally change the underlying clustering mechanism. And we have avoided coordination. The Agrijack don't need to talk to each other. They work independently on their own. There's no coordination involved. Because these, these are hard problems to solve. So what we've sort of done here is we've moved the broadcasting mechanism uh, or responsibility from the database. And if there is any uh, application state from up from the applications and from down the database into the orchestrator. And so the orchestrator is the service that is kind of dealing with all of this. Um, and just to recap how this would work is uh, this is the same diagram essentially. Uh, you would have Agrizar running, and the app would just be watching over these zookeeper clusters and reading new information. So this is what the new system would kind of look like. It's pretty much the same. You just added this extra dependency and this layer. Um, one of the future things I have in mind for this is adding another failover REST API to Abrajag itself, just as another line of defense, because we want to try and add as many lines of defense as possible, or we should at least have the capacity to be able to add those. So if you add a failover uh, endpoint, you can go back to your old promotion sort of mechanism, and instead of sending the requests off to your client, you send the requests off back into Abrajag itself, which would most likely be a local host call. Um, and then it will do the same thing again. It will just run the same event loop again, but on a more uh, trigger basis rather than a polling passive way. Uh, so it, just sort of, it would be like a push and then poll and then broadcast kind of mechanism. Uh, this is something you should do. Agrizar also runs a separate thread which monitors all of this information. So there, these are actually from uh, one of our Grafana dashboards. Uh, Eccentric as one of the services that we wrote. Uh, that's, this is, this, so this is currently running on pre-prod, on staging. Um, this basically shows that one of the APIs is taken down, but another new one came in. Um, uh, this shows uh, the standby cluster getting up, a new cluster being attached, a new standby being attached. It also has a heartbeat of the service itself. This is the heartbeat of Agrodite that has been running continuously. And it also tracks faded nodes, so if you have faded nodes, uh, uh, but I do have some caveats and hinges to make, uh, which is the RepManagerD might not actually be best at the, con at the at consensus. As Agrizag is still extremely beta, we're adding another layer of dependency, and this is not a solution to all your problems ever. Um, which is basically what I mean by that is what about PG Bouncer? Um, the most appropriate use case for this uh, orchestration layer, in my opinion, is when you have application level connection pools and not PG Bouncers and or if you have PG bouncers running on the application side. Because if you have PG bouncers running on the database side, this sort of starts becoming uh, kind of counterintuitive. Uh, I posted this on the rep manager. Um, I was actually hoping Simon would be here. Um, but uh, I posted this to get an information about how to, what is the correct source of truth from rep manager. Um, I haven't got a reply in that. I mean, somebody replied to this thread yesterday. Uh, but not nobody from second quarter was actually applied from here. Um, 
this is post the 90s demo, so I would really like some help around this. Uh, regardless of this architecture, I think the takeaways would be that you should try and apply, whenever you pick, pick a clustering slash orchestration tool, just try to apply these axioms and probably to your current system, test them thoroughly, and then if you may, tell me that I'm wrong or what else. Um, these are some open questions that I have. We can take them offline, yeah, maybe. Yeah, I'll take them offline. Oh, that's cool. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Thanks for sharing. Uh, next up is from the Dilip and Rafia, who is currently working in the EDB as a principal software engineer and software engineer. They both have very good experience in query optimization, query parallelism. They're working as a developer. And I request them to start this with it. 